Okay, so, so I think we can go ahead and start, Dr. Ali. You can go ahead and introduce okay. me. Okay, I'll. First of all, I want to welcome all of you to this presentation. I want to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Samar Rai. Of course, everyone knows I want to welcome Dr. Mohanad. Dr. Mohanad is a pediatric ophthalmologist. He is the head of the pediatric ophthalmology uh, department and Allot Strabismus in University of Missouri in Columbia, uh, United States of America. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Mohanad for squeezing part of his time. I know he's loaded with lots of work uh, for us and the residents here. Uh, I think uh, everyone will uh, have a nice time listening to this valuable lecture. Dr. Mohanad, and uh, the mic is for you. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, Jamia, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it is an honor actually to be back with you. Uh, I remember I was uh, in Iraq last year and I had the honor to meet uh, many of you uh, physically in the Ibn Haytham. Um, I would like to thank you again for making time during the middle of the day. It is, I think it's uh, not the ideal time for you guys to attend a lecture. Um, but, you know, I've tried to figure out the time that fits your schedule and my schedule the best. You know, we are both working from home, my wife and I, and uh, to, now it's 6 a.m. in our time, uh, we just pray for her. So she's going to start at eight working from home. So I will try to finish my commitments before I become responsible for the kids at this point. Um, in addition, as I described with Dr. Ali, my Zoom account is up upgraded to allow unlimited time of uh, Zooming uh, that will expire today. So I'll try to make use of uh, the account property. Uh, quick housekeeping, you know, uh, points before we get started. Um, if you can tell that you are unable to mute, to unmute yourself. So basically by default, you are all muted. Uh, that may change during the course of the lecture. If we want to open mics, I, Dr. Ali or I can uh, uh, unmute anyone, anyone who has a question. Uh, otherwise, there's a, a, many ways of communication through the lecture. Uh, feel free to raise your hand um, and we can unmute you automatically. If you have questions, you can just type in the chat box and the chat here is private, so you cannot communicate with anyone. Uh, just gonna be me and Dr. Ali as a co-host. Uh, we're gonna see the, the questions as they arise. You have uh, some uh, interaction uh, icons underneath the uh, names of the participants, including uh, thumbs up and the clapping hands if I, if I said something good. Um, if I am too fast, there is an option you can slow me down, like raise the, uh, click on the button that slow me down. And uh, if you need break, which we are going to take a break in the middle, uh, but again, there's an option to click on the icons downstairs. Um, I am streaming this lecture live on YouTube on my channel and I will uh, give the link. There is a handout actually that has many information that I put in the lecture together, some links to some apps and uh, resources. They're going to be available as a, a single file, Word file, and you can share it with anyone, including the link to the YouTube lecture. I know uh, for some reason, for security issues in the chat at Zoom, if, you, if I put anything in Zoom, you cannot, in the chat box, you cannot copy it or take it out from the uh, chat for some reason. So I will send the document at the end to the chat box and the credit can spread it uh, through your other channels. Uh, but these basically have the resources for everything, including the recording for the uh, lecture. And um, yeah, I think that's it from the uh, housekeeping standpoint. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, pediatric eye exam made easy. So uh, I know many ophthalmologists, including our own residents and uh, you know, uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists uh, I've met, they are very fearful from uh, dealing with kids. When they come to the pediatric rotation, they have a lot of anxiety. How can I handle this uh, little creatures that jump around and scream and do stuff like that? Uh, interestingly, I did my uh, first fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at the Children's National, uh, 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 Children's National Health System in Washington, DC, which was the birthplace of pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, established by the famous uh, Frank Custom Bader and uh, Marshall Parks. Parks is the famous, you know, uh, guy who invented a lot of uh, 
interventions and procedures and uh, uh, tests for the pediatric ophthalmology, including the Bershovsky Park three step test for superior oblique palsy. He also described the monofixation mono syndrome and the Parks technique in strabismus surgery. When he applied to a job position at John Hopkins, uh, he was expressing to the head of the department that I like kids and love to dedicate my practice to kids only. The head of Johns Hopkins at that time said, what? Kids? I hate them. And he refused his position because of this dedication to kids. Then he moved to, to uh, Children's National and then he starts the first pediatric ophthalmology fellowship program in the nation in America. So again, dealing with kids is uh, anxiety uh, leading resource. Today we're trying to show to break it down in a um, joyful way. Um, for those who never met me, my name is Mohandas Samurai. I'm uh, the director of pediatric ophthalmology and assistant professor at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. And those who do not know is, what is that, it is this small red state in the center of America in the Midwest. The university itself is a, a pretty ancient university. It's like more than 180 years old. And our ophthalmology departments called Mason Eye Institute. It has more than 20 uh, faculty members covering all the subspecialties, um, except for neuro ophthalmology, but we are hiring someone soon, inshallah. Uh, we have residency program that is more than 60 years old and more than 170 graduates over the past years. And uh, currently we have three fellowships programs in cornea, glaucoma, and retina. And uh, we are in the process of discussing to start pediatric ophthalmology since we have uh, two pediatric ophthalmologists and two pediatric optometrists uh, work with kids. Uh, if you can see me hiding behind Zane Pickapoo in this picture. Okay, so let's go ahead with some important uh, tips to master pediatric ophthalmology examination. So I'm not asking you to be the best friend forever, but I want you to be as friendly, as funny as possible. You know, it's funny in, in Iraq and many of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, we have this social problem of creating a very glorious image for uh, the doctor and very frightening image to the doctor as well. So our parents always keep telling us, you do that, otherwise I'll take you to the doctor and uh, he or she will give you a shot, right? And um, so when kids come to you, they are frightened and afraid from being, you know, uh, get, get harmed. And that does not work in ophthalmology. You need a cooperative patient who can interact with you, who can tell you what are they seeing uh, to understand to, to like get their visual function done, to get you know stereopsis, visual equity, strabismus exam. So this uh, halo of fear that encircles the physician does not work well for pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, it's funny, it, I mean, I can practice that in, in here in America without this social and cultural barrier. So kids, I mean, love to come to the doctor, they give high fives, they enjoy talking about their beloved stuff. Um, when I had the chance to go to India last year uh, in the mission camp, uh, I faced this cultural problem. Kids are not responsive. They do not talk to me. They cannot answer my questions. So I start you know, applying my tactics and, uh, hey guys, how are you doing? How old are you? Oh, wow, you are six years old. Wow, you look so big. I like your shirt. Your shoes are so beautiful. It matches your dress such kind of comments that will break the ice and make the kid more comfortable uh, understanding that he or she is not in the classic uh, vector environment. Uh, I tried to go further in breaking the ice with those patients in India so, and I discovered that I have uh, uh, manicure you know uh, tactics and started like nail polishing some of the patients and uh, I was a part of a mission uh, a group of volunteers who spread uh, toys and uh, gifts to the kids. So um, and that was a very, very joyful experience with them. And I think they they um, had different experience. Again, for the sake of uh, breaking the ice and get kids motivated to interact with you, you have to be funny and friendly as possible. That's why I never wear white coat over the past five years or so. Um, so I to keep in consideration that many kids have white coat phobia. So uh, I just walk in with 
either my scrubs or my uh, classic outfit. Um, the other important thing with kids, you should not follow orders. We all know that uh, we start with history taking, then go to the examination. Examination entails visual acuity, right eye, left eye, and uh, certain steps in your mind. That's important to cover everything, but it's not need to be in order. So if you are dealing with uh, hyperactive, distracted kids, and you spend the first 10, 15 minutes of your encounter taking history, um, the kid will be upset and distra distressed, and they're going to lose their uh, attention span, and you're going to lose what you need. If you think that you're dealing with hyperactive kid, you can go ahead and start with the examination and ask the history questions during or after the examination. I mean, especially this is applicable for uh, like follow-up kids. If you have, if you already know the case, you know the history, uh, you can cut short the, the time. And also, uh, as we're going to see in a second, we do not follow orders in terms of with how to start the examination um, in order to, to achieve and uh, keep their attention. Uh, save the best for last. Uh, this is a, an English uh, acronym for the Iraqi uh, statement, Al-Tali Rabba Ali. So we don't keep the best for last in, in kids. And we save actually the worst for last. And what I'm saying here, um, the worst is the eye drops, the dilating eye drops, and the, the steps that including touching the face and the eye, like uh, checking eye pressure and stuff like that. So we keep those for the last because we want to make the maximum benefit of the time interaction with kids and avoid and defer the ones that, you know, distress the kids the most to the end of the encounter. And lastly, remember your mission. I One of the statements that struck me when I was a resident as one of uh, American pediatric ophthalmologist who, uh, who came to Jordan during my residency and he said, we are the only field in which we train the brain what to do. And if you think about ambulopia treatment, this is what we are actually doing. We are not treating cataract or doing leading surgery as comprehensive of what you do. And just on the spot, we are dealing with kids when we impact their life and improve their vision that cannot be saved otherwise, you are impacting not only their lives, but Im impacting the life of their families and their subsequent children and offspring. So basically you're impacting lives and keeping that intention in your mind and the mission that you are uh, you know, going to practice with, that will give you motivation to overcome the challenges that you may see in kids. At the end, do what you can and it's okay to miss other stuff because our encounter is limited. Okay, so I will start with, with sensory examination. Um, in sensory examination here, uh, so I will split the lecture into two uh, sections, uh, sensory and motor examination. This is my son, Safe. Uh, you just wake up from them. Yeah, so we're gonna start with, with um, uh, sensory examination and here we're gonna start with no touch binocular examinations. Uh, before we start covering one eye and uh, putting patches and stuff like that, let's introduce the exam for the kids in a funny way that entails no bothersome or no uh, distraction to the kids. So we're gonna start with binocular test, the stereopsis, the word for that, color vision, and then I will go to visual acuity, starting with quick introduction of uh, binocular vision and then switch to monocular. And plus we have the visual field and the pupils examination. So uh, I start my exam by saying, hey guys, let's do, let me show you my funny glasses. And we have these glasses that has uh, occluders in, in either eye and you have the glasses that has, I mean, the words for that and the stereopsis. And let me show you how it looks. So I pull up my titmus test and uh, look at the fly and then I put the glasses on the face. Oh, wow, the fly is popping out of the page. Can you push the animals that pop out of the page? And uh, they basically, you know, uh, will be more attracted when they see the fly coming out of the page. Um, this is also helpful uh, test in, if you, you are facing uh, suspicious cases of uh, malingering, for example, because, you know, um, patients who can see three animals out of three, which is equivalent to 100 seconds of arc, this is equivalent to five circles on the on the, on the test itself. So um, if a patient, for example, sees three animals and only saw one circle, this means there is something wrong in the test and you can tell that their complaint may not be relevant exactly to uh, 
um, their complaint. Then we have the words for that test. And uh, as you know, simply we, we put uh, the word for dust the test for effusion, as you know, the molecular function. So we put the glasses, the red green glasses, the red on the right, so think about RR, red over the right, and the green over the left eye. And uh, as you can tell that the red filter will block the green and will make the white circle looks red. Uh, on the other hand, if the patient looks through the same pattern by the left eye only, the white circle appears as green. So uh, in order to increase participation here, uh, I do have a poll, All right? So um, you're gonna see a poll on the screen right here. What will be your answer if a patient reported four circles, two reds and two greens, or uh, one red and three greens, or one red, two greens, and one half and half? So what do you call the results? Um, let me just make the notation here. Uh, do you see the, the poll? Yep, here we go. Yeah, so just click on the, on the poll to give you your response. What does it mean if you see a patient who described four circles? All right, cool, most of you get it right. So it is fusion, you're right. All right. And let's go ahead to the second option. If a patient reported the this answer only, what's gonna be your impression? So relaunch the polling. Let's start from scratch, go ahead. So if the patient only saw two circles, Perfect. All right, most of you get it right. Yeah, so it is uh, shared results. Yeah, most of you get it right. So yeah, if the patient sees the white circle as red and they could not see the greens, this means they're using the right eye only, which has the red filter, red, remember RR. So this is uh, left eye suppression. And on the other hand, um, this by default is gonna be the right eye suppression. If they only see three green circles, this means they cannot use the right eye and they use left eye only. This is maybe due to you know any history of envelope in the right eye. Okay. So let's stop sharing the results and let's go here. What if the patient described seeing five circles in that pattern? So the right, uh, sorry, the, the red light is on the right and the um, green light is to the left. Here is your poll again. What do you think? All right. Yeah, diplopia is kind of confusing here, but you guys get it almost right. So yeah, um, let me um, show you the other option. And let's relaunch the, the test again. So what about the patient described the same feature, the five circles, but they are flipped. The, the red is to the left now. Great. You guys are awesome. Perfect. Okay, for the sake of the time, I'm going to terminate it and share the results. Um, yeah, you guys on the spot, you get it right. So again, if the if the right if the red light seen to the right and the green to the left, this is uncrossed diplopia. But if they flip, so the 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 red circles that's supposed to be seen by the right eye are described by the patient to be on the left. This is crossed diplopia. 
and um, and that basically means that we are having exotropia. So think about cross as x and exotropia as x xt, where n crossed is isotropia. Okay, I will not go with the details of the uh, physiology about that, but just think about this mnemonic X means XT, exotropia. All right, we'll go to the visual acuity test. So basically, as you know, uh, Snellen uh, linear acuity charts are the gold standard technique. Although, we, I mean, from research standpoint, we use EDTRS or Logmar visual acuity that has uniform uh, optotypes in each line. Uh, and kids in real life, this is challenging because first of all, it is very confusing and uh, there is many letters that can overlap and may misinterpret your results like M and N, uh, C and O, uh, these kind of F and P. So these letters are almost overlapping and almost always lead to um, uh, confusion when dealing with uh, visual acuity check. Uh, the mother screens allow us to isolate single line or uh, which make that's better for, for kids to evaluate their vision. Um, dealing with HOTV, a vision chart, is more reliable in kids because uh, it avoids the confusing uh, letters. Basically, you have only four optotypes. Uh, well, the ones are, that are more familiar to kids at younger age, uh, these are the first letters that kids learn before, like in their PK or the kindergarten level. And again, with the modern screens, you can either have a, a, an isolated line or you can make a blocked single optotype with using crowding bars. And uh, I love the, the, the single crowded optotype in vision check because it eliminates distraction. Uh, sometimes kids may have hard time understanding where to start from right to left or left to right. So you may misunderstand their, their answers and they can just throw, throw random uh, answers quickly. So uh, as you know, in the classic, um, description of vision chart, um, you have an, a space between each optotype and the next that is equivalent to the width of the single optotype. So basically you can fit an H on the screen here between uh, the H and O, right? And then you have uh, a space between the line and the next that is equivalent to the height of the optotype on the second line. So uh, in order to, uh, to maintain this minimum angle of resolution in visual interpretation, um, we typically go with uh, single crowded optotypes that uh, create lines that divide the distance between optotype and the next into half. So this is 50% of the distance between H and the next H and 50% the distance from the H and the second line underneath it. And this is important uh, function in vision checking kids because, I mean, with ambilopia, you know, there is uh, the crowding phenomena, which means that their vision may be enhanced if you check it with single optotype uh, without crowding bar. So the crowding bar will give you as accurate vision check as if you are checking with linear optotypes. Um, uh, Leah is the second preferred uh, visual acuity test for kids who are nonverbal or preverbal who cannot know uh, their letters yet. And this entails the four famous shapes that the kids typically uh, familiar with. You can start that from age two or three. And if that is, and that's also come with the single optotype or linear optotype, it's important if you use to point at the line or the shape uh, or the optotype on the screen, not to keep your finger on the on the optotype. So if you want to stand next to the screen or use the arrow on that come on the screen, uh, you point at the first one and you remove your hand. Don't keep it on the target that will enhance performance. So just point and remove your finger and say, what was that one? Uh, if Leah is not applicable and the kids are not familiar with, with those shapes, we can go with Alan. Alan is less you know reliable. As you know, um, you can tell that many of the optotypes are either very old and many kids cannot tell what that phone is. Uh, those iPhone generation has no idea what that looks like. Uh, plus um, you have some shapes that are more wide than height, like this car, or they are more tall than uh, wide like this uh, tree. So they are not exactly defining the definition of optotype, but you know, it is better than nothing if you want to quantify visual acuity. Uh, also, most of these charts come with matching 
a matching chart. So if they cannot tell what is HOTV, especially like in, if we have some language barrier in, in, in like in other languages, uh, people can just point at the letter that matches the shape on the screen. And we can make it interactive. Hey guys, let's do the matching game. So I will show you the letter on the screen and you point at it in this chart in your hand. Um, occlusion methods. Uh, I would try to make it as fun. Okay, let me show you how to play peekaboo. So you put the secluder and then you open it on yourself. So kids will understand this is the thing that's gonna cover their eyes. It's not uh, driving anxiety, it's something fun. Or you can use uh, the adhesive patches and I tell them, okay, let's play the pirate game. So I put the patch on my eye myself and uh, ask them, okay, so see it's not hurting. I can take it off and put it on. Why don't you do it yourself? Uh, or we can use the fun glasses. These are the magic glasses. Let's try the tiger glasses. How about trying the parrot glasses, the butterfly glasses? These are the things that make the experience more fun. Or you can ask the parents to help you. So they can cover their kids' eyes, uh, make sure that they use the palm of their hand, not the fingers, because kids can sneak between the fingers. But never ever trust the kids because they can peek a lot. Okay. Another method of occlusion, if you have nystagmus, we have to fog one eye. So we can either use the translucent uh, occluders that degrade the image without blocking it, because if you, if you, as you know, if you block the uh, the vision completely in uh, eye with nystagmus, you may unmask the uh, latent component. So nystagmus may worsen by that. So either use translucent occluder, or you can use high plus lens um, to fog the the eye to see the vision in the other eye. OK. Uh, before going that far, um, do we have any questions? OK, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Do you guys have any uh, comment, any reaction? OK, there is one no signal here, which means I think there is no question. Um, is it clear so far? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, can you classify VA test by age? Yeah, we're going to say that in, in a second. Can you? The polls. Okay. We are going back to the polls in, in the next subsequent slides. Um, so, checking vision method by age is kind of challenging because you may have a kid who is um, super distracted or have some language barrier or the speech delay or uh, other factors that make him at six or seven years old, but they cannot do barely nothing, right? Or you have a very smart kid who is three years old and they can they know all the letters and can do Snellen. So you judge your your vision test based on the factors that you can see in, in your environment. Basically, I ask if I have questionable patient age, I ask, um, does he go to school? Does she know her letters? So that will give me some idea where to start. So uh, most of the time, I prefer to start with HOTV because it's not inferior to, uh, to Snellen. And uh, I will give it a try. Okay, let's do a matching game. This is a single edge with a crowding bar. Can you find it on the, can you tell what it is? If they cannot tell, okay, let's go ahead and try it with the matching. Can you point at the chart and tell me if, uh, if you can match it or not? If they fail at your TV, then we can go to the uh, Leah. And if Leah is confusing, I go to Alan. So it's a try and error based on each patient's age and education level and, uh, you know, developmental background. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, so if, imagine if you have a kid, let's say 18 months old, and uh, you tried everything and they cannot interact with your uh, distant acuity charts. They are not interested in looking at the screen. They are small enough. They cannot understand what you're talking about. So we have to evaluate their fixation behavior. And in fixation behavior, we describe it as uh, CSM. C stands for central, S stands for steady, and M stands for maintained. So Central here means that the patient is using central fixation or eccentric fixation. And here will bring us to the concept of angle kappa, which is the angle between the anatomical axis and the visual axis. The visual axis is the line that connects the fovea to the center of the cornea. 
which is depicted here in the red line in this picture. And the anatomical axis is the line that uh, mark the, the connection between the, the center of the anterior pole and the cornea and the center of the posterior pole, which is basically slightly nasal to the fovea. So that mean, that's why we have uh, an angle kappa that is normally how much? Let me see in the chat. So guys, can, can you type in the chat box, what is the normal angle kappa? Perfect, five. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it is plus five degrees. Um, so the fovea is slightly temporal to the anatomical axis. That gives the angle kappa a slightly uh, positive angle. How that's important. So if we have conditions like myopia that lead to staphyloma and you know displacement of the fovea mostly nasally. So if you go back here, you can tell that the fovea here is located temporal to the central axis. But here, the fovea is located nasally, right? So that will lead that the light reflex will be displaced temporally on the cornea. Think about the eyeball like this. So when the things rotate, so the fovea moves uh, nasally, right? The light reflex will displace temporally. And um, that will lead to negative angle kappa. And that will give the impression of pseudo-esotropia. So the eye will look in because uh, the light reflex will be displaced temporally. On the other hand, in conditions like high hyperopia or uh, ROP, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, the fovea may be dragged temporally and that will give larger and more plus angle kappa. Uh, so the light reflex will be displaced nasally as in, in the left eye here. And that will give the impression of uh, pseudo exotropia. So the eye will look more out. Uh, I always believe that we, I mean, I'd like to make things understandable, but I, at the bottom, I prefer to give you some tips and mnemonics that you can memorize easily and uh, keep it in the back of your mind. So to put that in the uh, memorizable mnemonic, think about myopia, let's, let's change it into oh, neopia. Uh, neopia, and then uh, which is correctable by negative lenses, that will lead to nasal displacement of the fovea, and that will lead to uh, negative angle kappa, and that will lead to pseudo isotropia that will be uh, interpreted as inward deviation or obvious pseudo uh, inward deviation. Whereas if you have ROP or hyperopia, that is correctable the plus lenses that will lead to temporal displacement of the fovea, that will lead to positive angle kappa, and that will lead to opt out strabismus. I'm glad that you guys sit behind the screens, otherwise you may, I may spit with this piece <laughs> upon you. So uh, this is screen, this slide is copied in the handout I'm gonna handle you. This is just to keep in your mind to memorize that the myopia lead to pseudo-esotropia and the hyperopia and ROP lead to pseudo-exotropia. Okay, this is an example of a kid who came to me for a different reason. He was exposed to uh, lice shampoo in his eyes and presented with chemical burn in the cornea. Uh, he has Angelman syndrome uh, and has been treated with patching for presumed exotropia. And forget about the red reflex, he has been dilated with some correctopia and displacement of the pupil nasally. But if you focus on the light reflex uh, on the cornea, it is not in the center of the cornea in both eyes. It is in fact at the junction of the third and two thirds. So the patient is fixing straight at you and there is no true exotropia. The eyes are straight and you do cover and cover test, he is ortho, but he has such a large, you know, uh, angle kappa in both eyes that gives you impression of pseudo exotropia. So we can, if a patient has eccentric fixation, we can uh, comment about the fixation as uh, central versus eccentric or uncentral fixation. The study basically as the, uh, as the patient has nystagmus, the there's gonna be unsteady fixation. So despite the patient may look at you with central fixation, but if the eye shakes, this is uh, unsteady fixation. Let's go to the important component, which is the maintained uh, CSM, the third component of the vision uh, behavior evaluation, maintained. So let's assume that you have a patient with left uh, exotropia like this. Right? 
Um, you go ahead and cover the left eye. The patient is looking at your toy uh, that you're holding in your hand with his right eye. Uh, the eye is straight. The light is at the center of the pupil. This is central. Uh, there is no nystagma, so it is, un, uh, it is steady. So it's central steady. And you uncover the eye and the patient remain looking at you with the right eye, so this is maintained. So the patient has central study maintained CSM vision on the right eye. You go ahead and cover the right eye. The patient will assume fixation with the left eye. So he will fo focus on you with the left eye. Okay, so it is central and it is a study. Uh, study. There is no, no nystagmus, right? But once you uncover the eye, see what's going to happen. The eye will automatically drift out again, which means the patient cannot hold fixation, this eye cannot maintain that fixation. And you're going to say this patient has left CSUM, central study, but unmaintained fixation. Okay. On the other hand, um, if you have a, a patient, another patient, the same exact presentation with left exotropia, you cover the left eye, right eye is fixing, uh, no movement, no shaking, you uncover the eye, the patient still prefers fixing with the right eye. This is CSM of the right eye. You cover the right, the patient will fixate with the left. You uncover the eye and the patient maintain decent fixation. They can look at you for a few seconds, then the eye will drift out again. So this is, despite the patient prefers to fixate with the right eye, but the patient can hold fixation with the left eye pretty decently. And we call this as CSM vision. So central study maintained. Uh, you can imagine there's some like in between situation when the patient can hold fixation for a few seconds. And this is when we call it intermittent, I call it intermittent maintenance. So here again, patient prefer right eye, left eye, uh, uh, assume fixation. You uncover the eye one, two, three seconds and it will drift out. So it's not as immediate as the UM and it's not as long as the M. So I would call this as CS intermittent M. So it's a, a notation that the patient may have some element of uh, ambilopia and they do prefer fixation with the right eye and that may indicate the ambilopia therapy patching or atropine. Okay, how about if a patient has no strabismus? Uh, has no strabismus. Uh, I will go ahead and introduce this test, uh, induced tropia test. Uh, let me see if we have any questions. Feel free to chat or raise your hand. Uh, I will ask your permission just a second. Let me see what's, uh, yeah, one second. Let me see the chat box. All right, sorry for that. Um, okay, so no more questions for now. Okay, let's go ahead. So we, we spoke about if you have a patient with the strabismus, you can uh, tell which eye is the one that maintain fixation. How about if a patient who has no strabismus? And let's assume that you have a patient with an isometropia, right? And there is difference in the visual function uh, between both eyes, but they do not have strabismus necessarily. So we have to induce the tropia by holding prism in in the following way. So you have this patient, okay? Uh, they are looking at your toy and you can see the, the light reflects in the center of the pupil. You go ahead and put a prism. Uh, I typically use 16 to 18 prism diopter base down. I will come to this in a second, why that amount and why that direction. So when you put the prism in the front of the left eye, base down, as you know, the light will be deviated toward the base, right? So when the, the light come from the image from the toy, hit the prism, it will deviate downward to the base. And that will mean that the, light, the image and the fovea will displace inferiorly. So the eye need to fixate by moving the fovea downward and the eye will rotate vertically upward. Okay, so imagine the eye will rotate on an axis. So the, the, the fovea will move downward and the cornea will move upward. So there will be Supraduction of the eye under the prism. But according to Hearing's law, the other eye will also move in the same direction to assume fixation and to avoid the diplopia that you caused by your prism. 
So if the left eye under the prism moved upward, this means it, it did appreciate the image shift and it can maintain fixation by moving upward. And this is reflected by the other eye moving up. So we'll say this is CSM fixation of the left eye. Whereas let's say the patient has plus four, plus five hyperopia in the right eye and there is ambilopia, right? Uh, you put the prism in, the image will shift in the fovea, from the fovea, but the patient has ambilopia and they do have suppression scotoma. So even the, the image shifts inferiorly, it's still falling within the suppression scotoma of the ambilopia. And the eye cannot tell if the image changed, despite they can look at you nicely with, uh, with one eye attached, but they cannot appreciate the image shift. And that will lead to no movement in the eye under the prism. And thus there is no movement on the other eye. So this eye has CSUM, center study, but unmaintained fixation. Okay, seems as we have question. Okay, here is a video to show you uh, in real life. Okay. Where's doggy? Where's doggy? See how the left eye shoots up when you put the prism over the right eye. This kid is Girl, 18 months doggy? old, and you can tell that we can achieve doggy? a decent where's doggy? vision check in this kid. Good, where's doggy? Where's doggy? So we are holding a toy in the other hand. Where's doggy? Point to the doggy. Where's doggy? Good girl. Where's doggy? That's it. Great job. So I hope you saw this uh, vertical eye movement. Um, I was trying to see if we have any question. All right. Uh, let me see. I cannot see the chat box for some reason. Let's keep going. Okay, so um, most of the time for younger kids, you cannot, they will not interact with your prism. So you put the prism, they will just keep moving around and they cannot fixate on your toy. So the best next step on checking vision just to see if they can fix or follow, F and F. So covering one eye, holding the toy, the patient can move and track your toy. This is fix and follow, cover the other eye and see if they behave the same. Uh, if the patient accepts the patch on one eye and become reluctant and fussy when you cover the other eye, this means this eye cannot see well when the good eye is covered. Normally, from the milestones uh, standpoint, uh, kids start developing uh, fix and follow behavior uh, by the third month of life, and they will be they should be able to reach by hand for the toy and the object by the fourth month of age. Uh, before that, in the first two months of life, basically the normal vision will be just a blink to light. So let's recap on visual acuity. Uh, we start with Snellen as the preferred gold standard technique. We go to HOTB linear or blocked optotype. And then we go to LIA, which is more sensitive than Allen. And then uh, we check the fixation behavior if it is central study maintained, if there is strabismus or not. If there is no strabismus, we are going to induce the tropia by the ITT test, the induced tropia test. If the patient cannot handle the prism and they just keep moving around and very younger kids, we uh, annotate by fix and follow. And for the, for the very young kids uh, in the first two months of life, we just depend on the blink to light uh, fixation. We do have other techniques in checking vision in kids. They are more sophisticated and entails more expensive equipment, including tests that um, belong to, to the concept of preferential looking. So you, you judge your visual acuity based on the kid's reaction uh, to where do they prefer to look. So, and this is basically the Teller and Keeler acuity chart, which basically uh, um, cards that has pattern in one side and blank on the other side. And the concept is that the kid basically prefers to look at the pattern, not on the empty space. And this pattern uh, goes gradually from very thick, you know, uh, pattern to very small faint patterns. If the kids become confused where to look at, this means they cannot distinguish the difference between the, the blank and the lines. And you just sit like a meter or two from the patient based on the each chart that you handle. And you just look at their face. Where do they turn? Uh, do they look at the pattern or at the empty space? Uh, more kid-friendly shape version is the card of cards, uh, which we do have in our practice, which is smaller cards with more friendly shapes. Uh, like the ones that you see upstairs uh, in the corner here. Um, 
other technique is using VEP, the visual evoked potential, by uh, you know showing the kids uh, different uh, uh, resolution checkerboard, and we record the VEP waves uh, from the occipital cortex. Um, many people has complex belief and feelings about the VEP. Um, uh, I used to practice. I mean, in my practice, we don't depend much on VEP, although we have it. Uh, sometimes we have kids with uh, cortical visual impairment and optic atrophy, and you still see records uh, in the VP. It could be from the adjacent noises from the uh, adjacent areas. Some people depend and titrate their ambulopia treatment on VEP. So they believe in it so much that they can see uh, uh, the results uh, on the spot that they can see the, the impact of ambulopia therapy on the VEP results. Okay. So we came to the question section. I think we have a hand raised here on mute. Our hand, iPhone. Yes, sir. Do you have a question or you raise your hand by mistake? Okay, it seems by mistake. Uh, anyways, despite I do, pref I mean, encourage uh, uh, chatting and ask question in the chat box. Um, yeah, so thank you for reminding me. Uh, back to the induced tropy test. Uh, I use 16 or 18 prism diopter tests for this test. And the reason for that is first, if you do too small prism, you may not see the movement because the movement is very small and very uh, tiny. You cannot see it by your, by your naked eyes. And if you use too large prism, um, the image shift will be out of the fusional virgins. So, uh, and the patient may ignore the image shift and they will not, you know, try to fuse. But with uh, 16 to 18, it is within the fusional divergence of the patient. They will try to attempt to move the eye to, to keep fusing. The other uh, point is that um, holding the prism vertically is important because, uh, you know, we, we have uh, more uh, fusional vergence horizontally than vertically. So if you shift the prism, uh, if you put the prism horizontally, we have very strong convergence, for example. And the, if you know the, the normal convergence amplitude is around for 35 to 40 prism diopters. So patient can still accept more prisms and they still see single. Um, on the other hand, vertical prism will uh, you make use of the uh, reduced fusional ver vergence vertically. Uh, I hope this answered the question. What is the most appropriate method for rebuilding vision in uh, nystagmus? Yeah, so uh, nystagmus, basically patients, they need to be checked binocularly. So, uh, because this is the, this is the real life uh, vision uh, and this will rule out the impact of uh, latent component by occlusion. So, um, um, Make sure to check their vision binocularly. Make sure to check their vision in the preferred null point. So if the patient has null point in the left gaze, check their vision in this gaze and then compare that to the primary position to see if there's any difference in visual acuity that is entailed by the worsening of nystagmus. And also whatever chart you use based on the patient age, you can use Snellen, HOTV, LIA, as we said, but make sure that if you occlude, you use a fogging lens or translucent occluder. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. All right. So let me give you an example here, and we're going to ask you a question, uh, and we're going to launch the poll in a second. So uh, this is the importance of how do you interpret visual acuity. Assume I have two patients. And this is very frequent real life example. You have two patients, they are both exactly the same age, same gender, they're both 18 months old boys. Uh, they both came to you after they failed vision screening test. Uh, the patient A has CSUM in the right eye and CSM in the left eye, whereas the other patient has CSM, CSM in both eyes. Um, the patient A has right exotropia of 30 prism diopter while the patient B has intermittent exotropia of 30 prism diopter as well. Uh, we will come to this annotation in a second when we talk, uh, speak about, you know, uh, motility exam. Uh, refraction, 
uh, a little bit of difference here and the hyperopia here. What will be your diagnosis based uh, or suspicion uh, based on this result? Let's go vision recording differences and we are going to launch the poll. So here is the poll. What will be your impression? So each answer will have patient A slash patient B. Okay. Think about it. I'll give you a second and I'll be back in a second. All right, sorry for this interruption, I'm waiting for your results. Cool. Okay, so this is a tough one. So anisometropia make a little bit sense, right? Uh, but the difference is not that big. The difference is half the author does not explain the extensive embolopia here that the patient cannot fixate. Manifest trabismus, this is right, but uh, that may, may be the result of maybe strabismic envelope of the right eye, you're right. Uh, here I want to show you a real example that I faced in my practice basically. So the patient A had retinoblastoma of the right eye. So I know the, qu the question has no um, full answers. Okay, so this is the result. No one uh, get the, the answer, I don't, I'm not surprised, but um, this is what the real life looked like. So uh, again, when you say CSUM, this is an alarmic sign that one eye is seeing well and fixates while the other one is not. And uh, this basically resulted in sensory exotropy of the right eye with manifest deviation. Despite there is no much difference in the refraction, this patient has significant problem that will you know, initiate a very aggressive treatment. Okay, visual field is difficult to check in kids because they move uh, around a lot. I only pay attention to that uh, component when I have a patient with like cortical visual impairment, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, more nervous system or optic uh, uh, atrophies that they need to check the visual field. And the tip here is to try to get the kid's attention in the primary position with the large attractive toy and then come from the uh, quadrants with a smaller toy and see if they can appreciate the, the new one. So this is an example. I'm holding this right in my hand, and you can see that yeah. it distinguishes distinguish the toy that comes with the therapy. And this is right job. Uh, for the superior field, it's counting so they can see if your arm is standing. So the best way is to ask uh, oh, no, another assistant to, to hold the, the right toy hand. from the back. And, uh, try to go backward and come from up. Here you go. No, 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 Okay, then we come to the pupil examination really quick. Um, at this point, we get the kids' cooperation. We did most of what we want to do. And then it is time that we can go with more annoying tests that by bringing light close to the eye or even touching the eye. So pupil basically, if you hold the ruler in the front of the patient's eye, they will move around. You, can, you cannot depend a lot on uh, where to put the ruler. Uh, rule of thumb that I find very helpful is that if you keep in mind that the cornea is roughly around 12 millimeter uh, and the pupil is roughly around four millimeter, which is two thirds, of that, uh, sorry, one third of that diameter, okay? Uh, 
so again, normal size people is around four millimeter and with construction, it become uh, two. Um, people examination entails basically shining the light in one eye uh, and at a time and then do the swinging light test. So I did some animation here. So we turn the lights off, the people will dilate. You turn the light, both pupils constrict. You remove the light, the people will dilate again. You do the same for the right eye, they constrict. That's easy for you, I mean, it's uh, common sense. Uh, swing light test, you turn the lights off and then bring the light and then both constrict, you switch the light to the other side. They will dilate gradually during the transition, but they will constrict again. Okay, this is normal test. And then you have a patient with RPD, you cover, you shine the light, both people constrict, you swing the light here and the right eye will not constrict and left eye remain dilated, you switch back and both people constrict. So this means the patient has right eye APD, a relative efferent pupillary defect. And that can be caused by, you know, uh, optic atrophies of any reason, uh, advanced glaucoma or a severe retinal uh, pathology like uh, CRAO, ischemic uh, CRVO or total retinal detachment. Uh, it's important to remember when you do pupil examination is uh, try your best to get the kid focus on a distant target because when they focus on your light, on your toy, they will accommodate and the accommodation uh, as a part of the knee reflex, as you know, it will lead to meiosis. So that will mask the result, especially if you're dealing with conditions like um, dorsal middle brain syndrome that you have light near dissociation when the people constrict to, to accommodation, but they do not react to light. So you have to split the, the fixation target. Um, it's also important to keep strabismus in consideration. If you have a patient with one eye exotropia, the light should be coaxial to the visual axis. So when you hold the lights straight in the eye and this eye is out, if you hold the lights in the same direction, you are stimulating the peripheral retina and that will lead to false APD. So light need to be uh, pointing and coaxial to the visual axis. Tonometry, uh, as you know, Goldman inclination tonometry is the gold standard, but it's very difficult in kids. Uh, we use eye care. It transforms the way that we approach glaucoma significantly. Uh, eye care is really awesome and a beautiful technique that allow us to examine kids even months old. Um, I don't use tonopin because it's, I think, more uh, aggressive and kids will scream and cry and that will false uh, uh, increase the pressure. Uh, Perkins, like Goldman, uh, it also entails close approximation to the kid and they become so fussy and the, the pressure will be falsely high. Uh, I do trust my fingers better than anything else. So digital palpation will build up experience, uh, especially if you compare your fingers to the preferred method of palpation. You can tell this is firm, feels like up teens, like 16 to 18. This is low teens, 12 to 14. With the practice, you can have the sense of how uh, firm the eye looks like. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys have eye care in, in Iraq, but this is the quick you know, uh, technique that you have to be within four to eight millimeter from the cornea and per perpendicular to the cornea as possible. And uh, the best uh, results are the ones that has no uh, dash in the middle or the one that has dash at the bottom. Okay, we'll take a break here and we'll go back to the chat and see. So again, I, I I like chatting and I mean, questions in the chat box, it will uh, eliminate distraction, but at the same time, I would love to hear from you guys uh, to keep this in a more interactive session. And also, um, you know, the world is like small village now. And uh, we, myself personally, I had a lot of challenges in my English uh, accent when I first came to the States. And I learned a lot from talking to people, and especially from my kids who learned me, uh, taught me a lot. So uh, it's important to build up this conversation and this skills. It's okay to make mistakes. Uh, as long as we practice how to speak, uh, we learn from each other. Uh, we want to build not only good ophthalmologists, but we want you to be leaders in the field and good public speakers and inshallah you can present in, in international meetings. Uh, without hesitation. So I would love still hearing your questions, not only seeing them uh, typed in the chat box. So anyone who has a question, please raise your hand and I'm going to unmute him or her and listen to their question. What about finger tests, uh, CAT for the assessment of VA? 
uh, etude in which sequence you already put. Uh, I'm not sure what do you mean by uh, finger test? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this is the hand that has a finger point in different directions. Uh, I only heard it from a friend in Iraq. I never saw it in my practice at all. Uh, again, the the most uh, used test that we do not trust is the Allen. Uh, I know there is uh, the tumbling E, the tumbling C, the, uh, the finger test. I just heard about it recently. I'm not sure if there's any uh, studies publish that and compare that to the gold standard technique. Uh, again, the, the same concept, if you have a, a, a cartoon, like a cardboard chart hanged on the wall with 50 or 60 optotypes and you ask the kid to go over them one by one, it's gonna be very confusing to him and to you and very time consuming. Whereas if you just isolate a line of optotypes, no matter what they are, but at least they are less confusing and you trust that then they'll be good. Uh, my concern is that this uh, finger test may be not as sensitive because it looks like that is more tall than wide and that may not uh, fit the de definition of optotype. Yes, uh, yes, I'll just jump in for a moment, uh, Dr. Yes, Mannan. Yes. Uh, uh, just a, a little comment uh, to stir things up. Uh, I, I remember two years ago, I, I uh, made a request uh, to Dr. Ammar uh, mm -hmm. trying to eliminate the use of white coats in in pediatric department. Nice. And uh, yeah, but <laughs> all the optometrists, they refused that time. Uh, yeah. And they said, well, how can we wear a white coat? Uh, and so I did. I started doing it myself before the, uh, you know, the outbreak of the Corona. Uh -huh. uh, I would go in, walk into the pediatric department, uh, wearing my scrubs, just like your pictures there. Uh -huh. uh, and it, it 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 was a big difference, and everyone saw it. Uh, yeah. Most of the children they they have photographic memory, and they can they they know the doctor from his from his coat, and it's in their minds. So it's a very, very nice uh, thing that you're encouraging me to go on with yeah, this sure. step again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely white coat phobia is the real thing and kids become too scared. They cannot function well and you cannot get the information you need from them. Uh, why retinoblastoma not manifest strabismus? So that's, uh, I think it's my mistake not making the, the answers uh, uh, less confusing. So um, it is manifest strabismus for sure, but I'm not in the uh, in the statement of talking about uh, uh, strabismus, whether it's manifest or intermittent. I didn't go to that section in my presentation yet. It's coming next uh, in the few next slides. I was focusing on the importance of uh, writing down, you know, um, the visual acuity. Of course, if you have long-standing uh, constant one eye strabismus, manifest strabismus in 18 months old kid. What manifest strabismus can that be? I mean, uh, you think about uh, um, congenital esotropia or exotropia. Um, congenital esotropia is, I mean, um, you have almost symmetric refraction and the uh, vision is almost always symmetric in both eyes with esotropia. With exotropia, uh, if it is conjunct exotropia, again, the, the difference should be um, minimal and the visual function, visual acuity should be symmetric. Unless you have sensory exotropia that allows the patient to fixate constantly in one eye and always, always ignoring the other eye. So there must be a sensory cause for the manifest strabismus in 18 month old kid uh, for manifest exotropia. So that's why I, I emphasize the the possibility of more serious condition that leads to sensory exotropia in this 18 months old kid rather than a congenital exotropia. What is the upper level of IOP in pediatric? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I do just use it as, as adults between uh, 16 to 20, I will say. Uh, eye care gives you high, false high most of the time. So I will not be surprised if I see 21, 22. And, and some of those kids, especially if they move around, they, they hold their breath, they squeeze, you know. Um, if I'm dealing with 30 and I verify it with my digital palpation, yeah, then this is a, a, a solid, reliable, uh, concerning high pressure. Uh, in embolopia, we depend on a crowded VA test or on the single letter test. So 
never ever use a single optotype without a crowding bar. So uh, kids with amblyopia have the crowding phenomena. It is a pathic mnemonic for them. If you check their vision with uh, linear optotype or the single crowded optotype with the lines, let's say the patient stop at 2060 or 2050 or 618, and you remove the bar with, and you just keep single letter, the patient can immediately enhance at least two lines. So they can jump to 6.9 or 6.12 or so. So, and this is not the true vision. The true vision is the one that appreciates the minimum angle of resolution. And that will be the best depicted by linear optotypes or by single crowded letters or optotypes. Um, when does it approach the adult IOP? I'm not a glaucoma specialist, but these are the same concepts that we use in adults. Currently, there is a major shift to uh, accept eye, eye care because it does not require any drops. It is less uh, annoying than the air puff. Uh, no disturbing touch by the tonopen. You are limiting the, the fact of indentation, the possibility of indentation. Uh, so eye care is a good screening tool. Of course, if you have glaucoma patients, you have to double check them with Goldman. What about uh, CAT for drum test or uh, optocantic nystagmus drum test? It is a good way that you can uh, check visual attention uh, for kids who are, have question of seeing or not. Uh, you know, with the drums, we have uh, fixed stripes and you cannot adjust them. Uh, so you can just see the eye movements with the, with the drums twisting. Although this concept has been used recently in some newly arising uh, softwares and apps uh, like on iPad that can check vision by using the optocanic nystagmus drum, but with changing uh, stripes density. So it can give you quantifiable uh, visual acuity. Uh, is retinoscopic exam mandatory for all kids or I could uh, rely on autorefraction and VA assessment? That's a good question. Um, when I started my first fellowship in children's, I had nightmare from doing retinoscopy. And uh, this is one of the weakest, you know, uh, training point in our re residency. I said, okay, I'm going to America. Uh, definitely, I will say, I will see like dramatic, like advancement in the refraction check. And they may have some tools, small stuff that you hold in your hand and give you everything. You don't have to bother with retinoscopy. And I was surprised. You have to master retinoscopy. You don't trust any other source of refraction. So it was a challenging learning, scare, uh, learning curve to me, but at the end, Handel, I think I, I did a great job with retinoscopy. Retinoscopy remains the gold standard technique in kids. But if you have seven, eight, nine years old kid who can sit very reliably on the autorefractor, then yes, go ahead and do autorefraction. If you have if you have a kid who is giving you very nice, uh, solid answers, you can try do manifest refraction on him, put the auto on the uh, far after on your tire frame and try one or two uh, to get the refraction check. Otherwise, uh, if the kid give you random answers that they have hard time focusing on the screen and they cannot put their chin more than a second on, on the device, you still have to do the, the retinoscopy. And you know, retinoscopy is not only um, a tool of checking refraction, you can use it to see the red reflex clearly. And that can uh, sometimes pick up uh, early cataracts, uh, eye surface problems, dry eyes, uh, many uh, findings that you cannot see unless you hold uh, you know, your portable uh, slit lamp. Dr. Ali agree with me. Yeah, so I, actually I was hoping to include a whole session about retinoscopy here, but it, it needs a separate lecture, inshallah. We may be able to discuss that later on. Uh, does ambilopia cause RIPD? This is a good question. Um, if you have very dense ambilopia and vision in the range of count fingers, I think it can cause. But basically, it is. Uh, it depends on the and the and the, um, and the wide and the width of your lights that you use the, the the people check with, and also on the uh, the size of the uh, suppression scotoma. But most of the time, it is optic nerve condition. The cat for drum we have has small dots and not uh, stripes. Um, again, I, I, I only use it for uh, checking like questionable cortical vision impairment to see if the kids uh, can appreciate the image shift. Um, it is very hard test for, for me to see the, if the eye really shakes and 
depends on this the speed that you twist your, your drum i will definitely use and believe in my prism more than using the drum for those kids all right any more questions i i need verbal questions so feel free to raise your hand we can unmute you okay so uh yep there is one more age of cyclopedic refraction so um i use if you if you talk about uh the drops for the first uh four months of life i use cyclomedrol which is a combination of diluted cyclogel cyclopentolate and diluted phenylephrine and we use that for uh, rop screenings and kids who come to the clinic younger than four to six months of age after age six months i will go with cyclopentolate one percent or two percent if we have very dark eyes uh, in addition to phenylephrine for the teenagers i use uh, tropicamide and phenylephrine and the reason why i use cyclopentolate for younger kids because you know they have very strong accommodation that you have to have a strong cycloplegic agent to dilate them to overcome their high accommodation in teens the accommodation is not a huge deal so you can use tropicamide uh, quick uh, decent you know uh, uh, mediatic and cyclopedic, uh, you know, medication. All right. So I want to make it slightly more interactive session today, and we'll take a quick break. That is not usually done in lecture session. We're going to make use of the blessing that we are uh, staying home and doing the uh, social distancing uh, situation. I will take this question later. So, um, you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, there is a lot of, you know, uh, focus on the healthcare workers and how that uh, being in the front lines affect their, you know, uh, well-being, mental well-being and the burnout rates. And uh, many uh, advocates try to um, release this physician stress and, um, promotes like advices like doing exercise and you know uh, avoiding resources uh, providing resources for physicians and healthcare workers to be to live healthier lifestyle and to elevate their stress uh, we'll take a break that is basically gonna be let me just uh, change my share screen into something else okay which is going to be right here. So we're going to do some workout uh, to increase our heart rate and make the blood circulate better than just staying on our chairs. OK. Um, uh, if you guys heard about Tabata, Tabata is a, a mode of exercise that has been clinically validated to be superior to uh, the classic you know, approach for exercises routinely. This article, for example, compared the Tabata exercise, or it's called HIT, the high intensity interval training, to the classic workout. So if you spend 60 minutes on your treadmill running, that will burn less calories than if you do four minutes exercise only. That is high intensity, done for 20 seconds each, and take 10 seconds break. And do that for uh, four minutes a day that will give you better you know calorie burning and uh, hearts you know racing compared to the classic you know time consuming treadmill so if you are visiting yourself in your room go ahead and call your kids it's a family friendly event let's go ahead and do some workouts okay so we're gonna increase the screen do you see my screen my youtube screen Yes, yes, Dr. Mand, I see it. Okay, ready, guys? Let's go. Yes, yes. let's go. <laughs>
Oh, the city of the Let's go back. How does it feel? Let me listen to you guys. How is it going? Oh, yeah. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> I pure and not much related. Thank you so much. But I think we all need this, right? You could feel my heart be playing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I purposely unmute everyone. A very, very nice experience. Yeah, Victor Ali, you are free to unmute yourself. Yeah, so, you know, guys, uh, I personally, let me just mind for a again, so I'm going to mute all. All right, I think we are controlled now, admit all. Can you see who is not on mute? Okay. 
So this workout That's thing is really, one. very important for us, for well-being. I will tell you a personal experience story. Um, I do have diabetes type, type 1. Uh, I use insulin pump. And um, I've been struggling with weight gain for the past few years. And alhamdulillah, since December, I started going to the gym with the friends and their personal trainer coaching and uh, managing my diets. And alhamdulillah, I lost up to 25 kilograms over the past four months. So uh, doing exercise regularly and eating healthy diet, avoid carbs and sugars is really important. So again, I was talking about um, how companies now are trying to help uh, the primary, I mean, the health healthcare workers during this pandemic. So one of the apps that is very popular and uh, very interesting, it's called HIT, the high intensity interval training. It is, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of apps that use the Tabata technique in their exercises. This one is a paid uh, app, but they waive their payment uh, until I think the end of May uh, for public and they extend the free membership for uh, healthcare workers until July. So this is a really very nice, uh, good app. And they have seven different apps. If you go here, um, they have yoga for beginners. They have advanced yoga. They have a seven minute workout, which is basically I would recommend for those who start workouts for the first time. It gives you seven minutes a day only with uh, minimal exercise that you can adjust the level of, of hardship. So you start with level one, you can increase level two. And the cool thing about that, they will not repeat the exercise uh, every day. So every day you have a bunch of other exercises that keep you entertained. And there is a nice prenatal yoga training for pregnant ladies. And uh, yeah, get, you can download any of them. It will be available in the handout that I will give to you. All right, Thank you so much. Your, uh, yeah, it's really important. <laughs> Uh, okay. Just to, just to add that uh, uh, Nike and Adidas are, have also unlocked their paid apps on on the Apple Store, and yeah. I think also on Google Play Store. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's many of them. Like uh, yeah. um, some stores, uh, like giving out free free shoes, free you know, uh, childcare for healthcare workers. So this is a very nice time for us to get together. Uh, I will skip the questions that is not related to the presentation. Uh, so one guy said, my roommate is snoring, so I cannot do the workout. That's fine. I, I, I hope you guys enjoy it and uh, feel free to stick to a routine. If you, if you do that workout like 10 minutes a day after, after Futur, you can destroy all the Zlabi and Baklava and all the stuff that you consume during Futur. Okay. I will not talk about envelope in this session, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, in PRISM test, we put the PRISM base out to induce isotropia. But in isotropia, we also use base out PRISM to correct the isotropia. Is it confusing? Um, you are right. And I have I gave a, a thorough presentation about PRISMs uh, when I was in Ibn Haytham. So long story short, yeah, we use the PRISM to treat isotropia by holding the PRISM base out. But if we uh, hold the PRISM base out, over a normal, uh, normal aligned eyes, then we will induce exotropia that the patient will uh, overcome by convergence. That's why we use the base out prisms to measure the convergence amplitude to see how much they can overcome the, uh, the prismatic deviation of the image, uh, which is basically base out. And uh, not confusing, we can talk about that later in the presentation. I do have half an hour to keep going because uh, I, at eight, I have a faculty meeting as well. So let me go back to my presentation. And uh, let's see, the new share, here we go. All right, so you see my slides now? Dr. Ali, you see my slide? Yeah, yes, yes, they were clear. Okay, so let's go quickly to the motor examination. It's important from historic standpoint to ask about questions like, is the deviation acute or chronic? Is it constant or intermittent? Uh, is there any difference for you when you measure the strabismus at near than distance? It is when I always drifting or crossing or it's alternating. Other symptoms associated with the strabismus like abnormal head posture, diplopia or squinting. Um, so in motility exam, we have two components. We have 
the uh, duction and version measurements, the extension of eye movement, and we have the alignment check. And here we are gonna ha have three different sets of examination techniques, including cover test, uh, corneal light, light reflex test, and subjective test. So let's go ahead, uh, think about duction and version. It, uh, by here, we are checking the motility in all nine gazes of position and think about version as B as two. So we check version with both eyes open simultaneously. We do duction D as single letter D with one eye covered at a time. Um, if we have restriction in the eye movement, it could be either mechanical or neurogenic. Okay, and, uh, and mechanical, like if you have a blood fracture, right? And you have uh, tucked inferior rectus muscle, for example, that will not change the fact the muscle is already entrapped, right? So if you check both eyes simultaneously with version or you check one eye with duction, the restriction will remain the same. So think about mechanical M that the duction and version will be, remain similar, MM. But if you have a neurogenic strabismus like 6 and palsy, okay? And um, let's say right eye, 6 and palsy, the eye is isotropia. You ask the patient to look to the right gaze, this cannot move past the midline. But if you cover this eye, this patient may try a little bit more to move out. So with neurogenic, the duction is more than version. Okay. Um, this is important concept of the primary versus secondary deviation here. So this patient here in the right hand side has a right isotropia due to second, uh, secondary to uh, right six nerve palsy, right? So uh, you're covering the right eye, the patient is focusing with his left eye as normal. So we have this amount of deviation with the right eye because the left lateral is, is paralyzed and is weak. Now, if we force this patient to fixate with the paralyzed right eye by holding the patch over the left eye, the patient will try the best to move the right eye from isotropia to primary fixation. And that entails uh, exerting extra stimulation to the paralyzed uh, right lateral rectus muscle to bring the eye to the primary position. And during, uh, according to hearing law, you can have the exact same amount of innervation to the yoke muscle of the left eye, which is the uh, medial rectus muscle of the left eye. That will lead to higher ESO deviation in the left eye compared to the, to the primary position. So you can see the esotropia here is larger when the patient is forced to fixate with his paralyzed right eye uh, than the, the actual deviation itself. So that's an important point to keep in your mind. When you check motility, um, we basically divide the, the space between the, the nimbus and the canthus into virtually two halves. And we can divide virtually each half into two. And then we see how far the limbus can go in its way to the canthus. So if the patient is trying to abduct the right eye and they cannot pass the midline, this is minus four. And our neuro-ophthalmology colleagues uh, like to use the percentage uh, uh, description. So they will say 0% of movement, okay? Um, if you go further, the patient can move slightly beyond the midline, this is minus three, uh, halfway minus two, minus one, and zero means the eye can move all the way out without restriction. Uh, sometimes you have very significant restriction that the patient cannot even reach the midline, even if you cover one, the other eye. So the, you can see the light reflex is displaced temporally. The eye cannot fixate in the middle. This is with advanced like Duane syndrome, or uh, long-standing six nerve palsy and stuff like that. So you can have minus five or even minus six occasionally. Uh, we have minus and we have plus, we have overaction, right? And basically, uh, which muscle is overacting in the left eye here? Can I see that in the chat? What do you think, what, what muscle is overacting in the left eye here? Inferior oblique, you're right. Cool, so we have, we can quantify that from plus one to plus four. And the reason for the, it's important to understand the function of the extracular muscles. So um, it is straightforward for the medial, lateral, the medial and lateral rectus muscles to do adduction and abduction. The obliques can have very uh, confusing, but if you think about it, uh, the, the relationship between the muscle tendon and the visual axis. So I always give this nice presentation for my residents. If you think the head, my head is the eyeball and my hand is the superior oblique tendon, right? This is the nose right here. I'm not sure you guys can see me. This is the nose. 
This is the trochlea and this is superior oblique. And this is the eye, the right eye looking straight at you. So if I move my eye to the nose in adduction, a deduction, when the superior oblique contract, it will depress, right? So when the visual axis is in adduction, the superior oblique is a depressor. And the inferior oblique on the other hand, the inferior oblique is an elevator. So they do the opposite of their name in adduction. However, if you do a deduction, that will create a 90 degrees between the visual axis and the superior oblique tendon. And when the superior oblique contract, it will lead to intorsion, right? The same thing for the inferior oblique will lead to extortion, okay? And to memorize that, keep in mind that, uh, you know, in English, when you, when you try to explain something, you say IE, I mean. So IE means that all the inferiors, whether obliques or recti, they are extorters. So they extort the eye. And um, the superiors, both the superior rectus and the superior oblique, both are intorters. Think about sine, cosine. Uh, so sine, superiors are intorters. All right, let's admit those two guys to the, from the waiting room. Okay. So here again, we check the movement. I prefer to go horizontally first. And, and this is basically a test for the uh, left medial and right lateral test muscle. And from there, I will go up, checking the left inferior oblique and the right superior test muscle. And from there, I can ask the patient to look down, try to hold the lids a little bit uh, to see the, the uh, corneas. And there's going to be the superior oblique of the left side and the inferior rectus of the right side. Go back to the midline and then move all the way to the other side. This is right medial, left lateral, right inferior oblique, left superior rectus. Go down. This is the right superior oblique and left inferior rectus muscle. Then go back to the midline and go up in the middle because the middle here cannot distinguish between the both elevators as well as the uh, depression in primary position will not distinguish the difference between the depressors, okay? So by this technique, you can isolate each muscle, especially in adduction, the obliques. Uh, most of the time when I have a kid that is not so cooperative, I check the primary and up, and they save the down for the last because when you, start holding the eyes, they're gonna become fussy. So we'll save that to the last, as we said. And this is the way I do prefer to, to interpret the, the motility pattern. So zeros means there is no uh, restriction. And this is the patient looking straight at you. Okay, so uh, this is the right eye, this is left eye. So if the right eye goes in adduction, this is zero, means there is no restriction. Um, elevation and adduction, zero. Depression and adduction. Now, abduction, up and down elevation in the primary line and down gaze. This is right eye, the same thing for the left eye. So this is how the normal eye looks like. Okay, I think I do have some polls here. Uh, stop sharing the results and let's see. No, they're not here. Okay, so in the chat box, what do you think this patient has? There is minus fours in this gaze. What does that mean? Type in the chat or raise your hand. Six and a half palsy, which eye? There is a way there. Right, you are right, perfect. So that is, this is right, stupid, uh, this is uh, right, six and a half palsy because the patient cannot move the right eye past the midline, minus four. What about this guy? This is more complex. In the chat box, what do you think this patient has? So it is mainly in the adduction. Perfect, because they are bilateral superior oblique palsy. You were right. So we said that superior oblique are depressors in adduction and the inferior obliques are elevators in adduction. So there is overaction and elevation and adduction. So this is inferior oblique overactions and there is superior oblique underaction secondary to superior oblique palsy. 
Now, a bonus question here. What pattern does a patient with inferior oblique overaction present with? So a patient has inferior oblique overaction. Do you expect to see V pattern or A pattern strabismus? Chat. V pattern, perfect. Dr. Zubaida, you're a good medical ophthalmologist. Come join us. Good, okay, so it is bilateral inferior oblique overaction and bilateral oblique uh, underaction, which is basically bilateral uh, superior oblique palsy. Perfect, so let's go ahead quickly about doing the cover tests. So as we said, um, we finished it, we finished the uh, vaccine inversion. Now we're going to check the motility and we have three subsets of tests that check motility or, or alignment. We have the cover tests, we have the uh, light reflex tests and we have the subjective ones. Cover test, there are three different tests here. We have cover and cover test. We have alternate cover test and we have simultaneous prism cover test. So let's start with the first one. Cover and cover test is a, actually a two test in one name. So it is two components. We have cover and uncover, okay? So think about it, it's a monocular test. So we do it on one eye at a time, okay? So we do cover test watching for the other eye to see if there is any fixation movement. Check for tropia, manifest tropia of the uncovered eye. And then there is uncovered component when we remove the patch and see if there is any movement happening in that eye under the patch to see if there is any foria. Okay? So cover look for tropia and cover look for foria. Here is an example. You have a patient who looks straight and nice ortho to you. You cover, you put the paddle and then the eye under the patch will move. And you cannot see it if you use like a, a, an opaque paddle until you take it off and the eye will refixate. Okay, same thing happened to the other eye. You cover the eye will cross, you uncover the eye will correct. This is esophoria, okay? Because the eye starts straight and end up straight after you've done the test, right? So important thing in, in notation here, uh, if you check that at distance, you put E only. If you do that at near target, you do E apostrophe, which means this is a deviation measured at near, okay? This is another example of exophoria, when the eye drift out and refixate whenever you take the patch off. Here is an example, drift, uncover, it will fix it again. This is exophoria at near and distance. Uh, this is a manifest exotropia of the left eye. So you cover the left eye, the eye is fixing, with the right eye is fixing, you cover the right eye, the left eye will fixate, okay? And once you uncover the eye, the eye will drift back. This is left exotropia. Okay, or uh, at near or far. Okay, this is uh, repetition. So uh, here I want to emphasize the fact that uh, although the patient may may prefer to fixate with one eye, most of the time, especially with exotropia, it is mainly intermittent. And it is mainly alternating. So they have equal visual acuity in both eyes, and they can switch fixation pretty decently. So you cover this eye the patient will fixate, you uncover the eye, the patient switch now. So the left eye now assume fixation, the right eye is drift out. This is, this is alternating exotropia. So you can put AXT, alternating exotropia, but just XT without any abbreviation other, other than that. So this is manifest exotropia, okay? If you are dealing with intermittent exotropia, then gonna be parentheses uh, across at the T, okay? So again, um, Think about foria, that the eyes start straight before you put the test, the, the paddle and the cover, and they end up straight when you remove the paddle. So it's straight, straight, but the eye drift briefly uh, with the uncovered component, this is foria. And the tropia, the eye started deviated because you have manifested tropia and end up with deviation. This is means this is dealing with manifest tropia, or if the eye starts straight and with the cover uncovered test, you end up with deviation, this means there was intermittent uh, tropia, okay? So think about that the foria eyes are straight before and after the cover test and the tropia, the eyes are not straight before and after the cover test. Is that clear? Do you have any questions about that? Dr. Ali, thumbs up, good job. You guys feel free to give thumbs up or like X, uh, anything in the, in the interaction that give me an impression where to stop and how to proceed. 
Okay, so this was the cover and cover test. Again, this test will tell you what does the patient have? Is it phoria or atropia or pseudostrabismus? Okay, then we're gonna go to the alternate cover test. As the name entails, we're gonna switch the patch back and forth between both eyes, just like the swinging light test with the pupil examination, back and forth. So it does not distinguish between tropia and phoria. It gives you the, uh, the whole picture. What does the patient really have, okay? So it cannot differentiate between the two. If we add a prism to them, you're gonna call the prism alternate cover test or PACT, P-A-C-T. That will guide you how much to treat, not when to treat, how much to treat. If you wanna do surgery, you're gonna base your surgical dose on the PACT, on the prism alternate cover test. And this is how it works. This patient with exotropia, okay? You put the patch as we know, this is we switch back and forth. The patient will fixate with the left eye. We switch back and forth, they will switch fix with the right eye. Okay, so this is exotropia and the patient switches. So this is alternating exotropia, right? Now I'm going to hold my 15 prism diopter base in and do the cover test and the patient still moving and fixing under the prism. So back and forth, the eye still moving, dancing back and forth. So I need to use a stronger prism. So I do 30 prism diopters here and I can see the light is centered in the, in the eye. And when I cover the right eye, there is no further movement. Switch back and forth. The eye is aligned. So this is your estimate of the strabismus. This is XT of 30 prism diopter. It took me maybe 30 minutes to, to figure out how to draw prism in PowerPoint, but I think it went well. Okay, important points about prisms. Uh, we use the frontal plane. In, in real life, the position of the minimum angle, uh, the minimum deviation position is the ideal way. And this is when the light, the, uh, the incidence angle of the light at one surface is equal to the uh, reflective uh, angle of the other side. But in midlife, this is difficult to achieve. The, the way that we practice is we hold the prism in the frontal plane. And that's important in a way that when you deal with the patient, let's say with large exotropia, we hold the prism when the back surface is parallel to the frontal plane of the patient. So you don't have to be perpendicular to the eye as the prentice position, because this will give you a wrong measurement, especially with larger angles. So just peace of mind, even if the patient has very large angle, you don't have to tilt your prism to make it perpendicular to the eyesight. Always keep the back of the prism parallel to the frontal plane. This is the frontal plane position. Uh, important to, to talk about stacking prism. So when you measure a prism, if the patient has a vertical and horizontal strabismus, you can, uh, sorry, um, if the patient has large angle strabismus, you cannot put two prisms like 20 and 15, one on top of, one on top of each other in the same direction, like base in. Right? You cannot do stacking prism. You can do stack prism if you are dealing with horizontal and vertical. Let's say the patient has right XT of 30 prism diopter and right hypertrophy of 10. So you can do 30 base in and 10 base down on that eye, but you cannot do stacking in the same direction. Uh, if, the, if you're doing the, the three-step test uh, for severe palsy, make sure that you, when you tilt the head in a certain direction, you also tilt the prism to uh, coincide with your uh, position. And keep in your mind the prior difference between primary and secondary deviation that we spoke about. The prism should be always held in front of the eye with the paralysis. If you hold the prism on the other eye, you are going to induce a secondary deviation and they're gonna be way much more than the, uh, the situation in real life. Okay, so we covered the cover and cover test. We spoke about alternate cover test. Now we are going to speak about simultaneous prism cover test. And SPCT basically is a test that measures the tropia only. Remember, we spoke about the alternate cover test that will give you the whole picture, the phoria and tropia together. But SPECT SPCT only measures the tropia component alone. And as the time until the term entails, it, it uses prism, right? So that will guide you when to treat. Remember, the, the prism alternate cover test, the PACT, gave us how much to treat. SPCT gave us when to treat. So here is an example, a patient, the same patient with XT, we hold the prism and the patch simultaneously and you still see movement over the left eye, which means you have to use a stronger prism. So we go with a larger prism 
And here you see that the prism was enough to neutralize the deviation uh, without the need to um, increase it any further. Okay, so this is simultaneous test. You do the patch on one, at the same time you do the prism on the other. Okay, um, I personally struggle with this test until one of my mentors back at John Hopkins told me that uh, she prefers to hold the prism in one eye and do the patch on the other eye and see if the eye moves under the prism and keep increasing the prism at the same way. So we don't do alternate cover test. We just do the prism one eye and put the patch on the other and see if there's any movement under the prism. Okay, there is a question here in the chat box. Manifest and latent. Yeah, so um, manifest means obvious deviation like this. So this is a patient will come to your clinic with one eye focusing at you, the other eye, the other eye is out so the, or in. So this is manifest deviation. The uh, intermittent or latent deviation is when the, the patient has straight eyes. And when you examine them and you break the fusion, you're going to show up a deviation that may be well controlled and the patient can bring it back or could be poor control and the eye will break out and remain out frequently. And that will bring us to the discussion on uh, when to treat. Because if you have a patient who has a manifest tropia of maybe 10, 15 prism diopter, which is not noticeable in real life, and people cannot distinguish that and has no impact on her social interaction and has no even impact on binocular function, then this is not indication for treatment, right? But if the patient is worried about that and he is so self-aware about his deviation and he wants you to go ahead and do surgery, you cannot only treat 10, 15 present diopters. You have to measure the entire component and measure to see if there is any foria or any latent component of the strabismus that may show up at the end of the day when he is exhausted or tired that may make this 15 present diopter exotropia become like 35. So when you treat, you have to take all the whole picture in consideration. That's why you have to use PACT, the prism alternate cover test, not only the SPECT, the simultaneous prism cover test. Okay, um, this is a, a nice table. I compare all the tests together and I have that in the handout. So I will give it to you guys at the end. So think about cover and cover test. It is a measure to tell you what is there. Is it foria or tropia? It is a monocular test. We don't use both eyes. You're just one eye at a time. Okay, it shows you, is there anything or nothing, present or absence? and there is no prism used here. And the alternate cover test, it gives you the total deviation, foria and tropia. And it is binocular because you're using both eyes. And it gives you impression of how much to treat, if you decide to treat surgically, how much you're gonna plan your surgery based on the alternate cover test with the prism. And it can have prism with it when you call it packed or no prism when you call it just act. Okay, and then we have the simultaneous prism test which, which tests the tropia only. And it is binocular because you use it simultaneously, prism and the cover. And this, this gives you impression when to treat. And it, by definition, it always has prism in it. So here is an example of two patients. Uh, again, patient A and B. The cover and cover test showed this patient has manifest exotropia, whether patient B has intermittent exotropia with parentheses, which means the patient's walking with ortho, but then break out into deviation. Okay, you come in and do simultaneous prism cover test, okay? Uh, you cannot do that on patient B because he doesn't have a manifest tropia. He, he started ortho, so the spit is not applicable here. Patient A, we put the prism and the patch simultaneously until we reach 25 prism diopters, okay? But then you decide, okay, this is 25, there's no further movement, let me do alternate cover test. And then you start seeing this deviation increase to 45, which means there is a Fourier component that's brought up and uh, broken out with alternate cover test that bring it up to 45, okay? Whereas this patient, patient B, he has 35 well-controlled intermittent exotropia that go back to ortho whenever you're done with, with measurement. So the treatment plan will be different. Patient B who has well-controlled intermittent exotropia with equal vision in both eyes, the advice is just observe at this point. Whereas the other patient who has manifest deviation that is big enough and that builds up to 45 with, uh, with the alternate cover test, then you have to do bilateral lateral test recession. And you aim for eight millimeter to address the 45 prism diopters and not only six to correct the 25. Okay. Um, 
one more thing before taking your question about this. This is very helpful resource, resource from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, if not sure you guys are aware about that. This is a strabismus simulator and it works like this. Let me show you. Uh, let me, here we go. So just quickly driving you through this. Um, this is a simulator that um, you can go ahead and um, test your knowledge about that. So for example, let's say this patient has um, 25 uh, present data exotropy, as we said in our example. Uh, okay, and there was also a foria of 20, or let's say 15. Okay, so um, you do cover test and the patient fixes the right eye. So this, there is a trophy there, okay? Cover the right eye. You do a cover test, and then you can see the exotropy. It is, it is manifest deviation, right? So since it's tropy, we're gonna use a combined uh, prism cover test. So we put the prism and the patch at the same time. We still see movement with the eye. So we go ahead and increase the prism power to 25, and then we come back and forth, and we see there is no further movement. But once you leave it for a while, Let's uh, dissociate that. So we said 25, right? And you put the patch. See, you break down the four now when you start doing the alternate cover test, which means you have to increase your power. Okay, let's go to 35. That is still moving. So we're gonna go with uh, 40. And here we go. We'll do alternate cover test. There is no further movement. So this means the patient has phoria of 15 on top of the 25 tropia. And this test can, um, can also take you to uh, a test mode. So it will give you questions and will e examine your knowledge about that. The link to this uh, site is also included in the uh, handout. Let's go back to my presentation, share the screen. And we were not here, let's go all the way down. Uh, here we go, and share this one, and let's take your questions. In SPCT, we put the prism on which eye if the patient has OU deviation? That's a good question. Any eye that you prefer. Since the patient has symmetrical vision, it doesn't matter. As long as it is not a paralytic or mechanical strabismus, it is not an entrapment or nerve palsy. Okay and uh, tests for near plus far. So we do this technique for far and near. It is very important when you de design your, uh, your surgical planning to do the tests at uh, far and near, okay? So you put the apostrophe sign when you are doing the, the near and uh, with that sign for far. What about the cover test in positive or negative angle kappa? Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, I will go to angle kappa in a second. Let's go ahead and show you the corneal light reflex uh, that will guide us to this answer. So and assume that we have very young kid, six months old, one year, that will not allow you to hold the prism and sit comfortably, allowing you to do the cover and cover test. Then we have to depend on our subjective perception or objective perception of how far the light reflex is on the pupil. So we have Hirschberg, Kremski, and the Bruckner test. Hirschberg basically uh, quantify roughly the deviation per each millimeter from the center of the pupil. Each millimeter is equal to seven degrees, which we never use in, in practical life. We use a prism adapter, and each angle equal to two prism adapters. So the bottom line, make it short, one millimeter of deviation equals to 15 prism adapter, roughly. So you can see average in the books up to 22 prism data, but, but less for the sake of uh, avoiding confusion. Each millimeter is 15 prism diopters. And the concept is easy. The cornea is 12 millimeter, right? The radius is six and the pupil in the center. Each millimeter displacement is equal to 15 prism diopters. So if the pupil displaced halfway, this is 15 prism diopter isotropia. If the light displaced temporally, if the light displaced nasally, this is exotropia, right? And we already said that the pupil is four millimeter normally, right? So, uh, if the light is at the edge of the pupil, this is two millimeter because we are dealing with the radius, right? So this is 30 prism uh, diopters. If it is just passing the pupil, this is 45. 
if it is midway between the pupil and the limbus, this is 60. And if it is just before the limbus, this is 75 prism diopters. And if it is at the limbus, this is six millimeter displacement multiplied by 15, this is 90 prism diopters, okay? Um, the most important landmarks for you to, to guide your measurement is the pupil margin, 30, uh, limbus, 90, between limb, halfway between limbus and uh, pupil is uh, 60, and just passing the pupil is 45. And this is an example of one of my patients. This is the largest angle I've ever seen in my life. You can tell here that the light reflex is centered in the left eye, but you cannot see it touching the limbus even in the right eye. So this is more than 95 or 100 prism diopters. Uh, we did the maximum uh, recess, resect procedure on him, and this is his result day one. You can see the, the light reflex nicely centered in both eyes. This patient has a 6'6 vision in both eyes. So um, limitation for Hirschberg, it is objective depends on you. And uh, it, it's, it's affected by angle kappa, right? So if the patient has a large angle kappa, it may affect your interpretation. But when you suspect an angle kappa, you cover the other, the good eye, and you can watch if the patient refixates or not. With angle kappa, the patient will not refixate. The, the light will remain displaced either nasally or temporally, which means that uh, the patient has false strab pseudostrabismus and you can quantify how much this false strabismus based on the displacement from the center. Like the kid I showed you with simultaneous uh, displacement of uh, his pupil, uh, his light almost two thirds from the uh, normal, this is at least two millimeter in each eye. So there is 30 prism diopter of pseudo exotropia in each eye adding collectively of 60 prism diopters XT. So this is what, this was significant pseudo exotropia based on the display, displacement of the light reflex that does not correct with refixation with cover test. If you have surgical pupil, if there's an esochoria or pupil dilation that may affect your interpretation. If you have microcornea, the entire dimensions will be you know, changed. So this is the drawback of Hirschberg. You can get better idea if you do Krimsky test by which you put the prism over the deviated eye, or you can use the reverse Krimsky test by holding the prism over the, the fixating eye. And you can quantify when the, the light will be centered in the pupil. This is very helpful when you are dealing with densely ambliopic eye. The patient has 2200 or 660 and they cannot see the distant uh, fixation target well. So you can just use the light reflex to see when they're gonna neutralize. The Bruckner test, the test usually done by optometrist. You compare the red reflex between both eyes. Um, since the light reflected from the macula, which is the thickest part of the retina, the, retina, the macula will absorb most of the light and the light reflected from the center of the retina will become the dimmer compared to the periphery. As the periphery has less uh, thick retina, so the more, most of the light will be reflected and you have brighter light. So if you have a strabismic eye, the light reflected from that eye will be brighter, BB, strabismic, brighter light reflex, okay? It can also help you in detecting refractive errors. If you have hyperopia, you may see plus crescent going upward. If you have myopia, you're gonna see negative crescent. This is an example. Uh, this is how the top image is when the normal reflex should be uh, comparable and symmetric between both eyes. If the patient has hyperopia, you're going to see upward crescent. And you can even tell there's anisometropia when the light, when the left eye is higher than the right. Uh, myopia is the same. Uh, it will give you, give you the down pointing crescent. In strabismic, this patient has right eye isotropia because it gives you the brighter right. Uh, brighter light, so strabismic brighter, okay? Because the light reflected from the periphery of the deviated eye, not from the center of the thick macula as you see in this eye, okay? Uh, subjective tests, uh, these are tests that we depend on the patient to tell us uh, the deviation, including Maddox rod, that's typically done by neuro ophthalmology, you hold the light and the Maddox in one eye, and you can uh, put the prisms to, to bring the, the light to the point. Uh, you have double Maddox rod that we use for torsion, we have Lancaster with the green test uh, and major ambulioscope. For the sake of the time, I cannot cover those. Make sure that you measure the strabismus in primary position, up, down, right, left, and also on the tilt if you are dealing with the vertical strabismus. And if you put the motility pattern that we spoke in perspective with the alignments pattern, this is the way that I learned to uh, interpret the strabismus. Here in the middle is where the patient looking straight at you. This is up and down. This is the patient right, right gaze, and this is the patient left gaze. 
And this is the patient's right eye in adduction, up and down in adduction, AB duction, up and down in AB duction, up and down primary line, the same thing for the left eye. So this is the normal interpretation of uh, strabismus exam. Let's take your uh, input about this patient. This patient has uh, right ET in primary, 10 in up gaze, 12 in down gaze, ortho in left gaze, and 60 in right gaze with minus five uh, here. And there is right face turn of 15 degrees. And here is the pole. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up the strabismus exam number one, launch polling. Here we go. So let me take it away from you so you can see the results. Okay, oops. Oops, sorry for that. Okay. Okay. I will stop the polling for the sake of the time and you guys did a great job, share results. Most of you get it right. This is six nerve palsy of the right eye. In Duane syndrome, it is, you know, it is the great mimicker of six nerve palsy, but um, um, the fact with Duane, we may expect palpebral fissure narrowing and adduction and also with overshoots, you may see uh, over elevation, over depression and adduction, which is not depicted here. So this is right, uh, six nerve palsy. I do have another questions, but for the sake of the time, I will skip polling and just give you the results. This patient has esotropia that is less in up gaze and more in down gaze. So the eyes are closer in down gaze and there is inferior oblique uh, overaction by over elevation and induction. This is V pattern esotropia. This patient has larger XT exotropia in down gaze and also in up gaze. So the eyes are drifted out in down gaze. So this is A pattern and that is caused by over depression and adduction of both eyes. So the superior obliques both are overacting and the inferior obliques are underacting. And that's lead to uh, superior oblique overaction and A pattern exotropia. This is a patient who has orthophoria and left gaze, a small left hypertropia and primary position that increases in down gaze and increase on the right gaze. And we do the three-step test, the patient has more left hypertrophy in the left head tilt. So left hyper worse in the right gaze and left head tilt with obvious superior oblique underaction and the inferior oblique overaction. This is classical left superior oblique palsy. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about uh, retinoscopy. This is a very important topic, but this is again, one of the good resources uh, on the American Academy of Ophthalmology. They are, it is already printed in the, you know, the handout I'm gonna give you. Let me just put the link to my YouTube um, lecture and the handout and give it to you guys. Um, I am done so far. I can take one or two questions uh, verbally before I go to my other faculty meeting. meeting. So, Dr. Ali. Okay, thank you so, so much. We are very, very uh, grateful for okay. such a very nice interactive uh, session that you gave us, Dr. Mohamed. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, really, uh, I'm sure all the the board students uh, had lots of fun. At the same time, they had lots of information that were clarified. Yeah, I know it's uh, overdose I, from you know after a busy no, day. It's but nice. <laughs> it's nice. No, it's very nice. We appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. Let me just put the uh, the file here, Mason I Institute. Okay. I think it's okay. Empty. I'll distribute it to the others. All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, help me if there's any yeah, question I missed in, in the chat box because I was trying to go over really quick. Well, actually, I saw them. There is no. If anyone has a question, please raise your hands, Shabab. Yes, we have one. I will okay. unmute Dr. Zaid. Dr. Zaid, yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Zaid, you can talk. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for this nice lecture. Yeah, I've okay. got only one question regarding the V pattern isotropia. Uh -huh. You mentioned that uh, it occurs in bilateral inferior oblique, in superior oblique policy with inferior oblique overaction. Uh -huh. I really can't imagine. 
how it works. I mean, in the superior oblique overaction, we imagine that the eye goes medially when uh, during elevation. Yep. And uh, with, with superior oblique palsy, the eye will go laterally during uh, depression. Why it is V pattern, not A pattern? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And the dynamic is really uh, interesting here. It is not due to the fact that the inferior oblique is... Uh, so what is the tertiary, the tertiary function of the inferior oblique? It will be the extortion, you mean? No, uh, the primary function is extortion. The tertiary function is, let me show you here. The obliques do abduction as a tertiary function. Abduction. Abduction, right? So think about yes. it. The, to make it short and easy, the oblique, the tight oblique will bring the eye closer to their anatomical insertion or origin. To their anatomical origin. So the, the inferior obliques are down here. When they are tight, they, they bring the eye closer to each other when they look down. When the superior oblique is overacting, they're tight, they'll bring the eye closer to the oblique origin, which is the trochlea, when they try to look up. This is the, the, the easiest way I convince myself to understand this pattern, you know, dilemma. But yeah, it is confusing. So we depend on the tertiary action to explain it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I put the. So much, uh, I, I know there's issue with, with copying from the chat box, so I put the uh, word document, including links to the apps that I mentioned. Yes. Uh, the link to the to the lecture on YouTube. Uh, my contact info is right here. Feel free to uh, reach out to me with any questions. Um, you can scan this barcode that will add me to your contacts. It has my work email, my cell phone, and all the important contact info. Inshallah, we're going to stay in touch. I'm sorry, I need to go to the other faculty meeting that started like 15 minutes ago. Yes, I, I, I know you're busy. Thank you so much. I hope this stay clarified safe. and make it easy a little bit about uh, pediatric eye exam. I hope you guys enjoy. Inshallah, we stay in touch. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Ramadan Kareem, everyone. Thank you so much. Ramadan Kareem. Thank you. Good luck.